so hello, I'm back um, with our last uh, leg of this um, lecture to show you a little bit about um, uh, art movements that don't fall so neatly into kind of state, non-state, or um, also to show you kind of the development of contemporary art uh in the different ways in which contemporary art developed in vietnam so if you recall i mentioned the artist bui sun phai who had been sort of marginal to mainstream official art discourse in his street paintings he um uh, was friends though with many many artists so even though he was marginal to mainstream official art circles most artists knew him anyway so he wasn't that marginalized if you will so there's a little bit of a um, disjuncture between how he's written about and who he really was similarly to this artist uh Vu Zantan, who um never went to art school um but was very interested in uh art and practiced art his father was a playwright and he owned a house in the middle of the city in Hanoi in the streets uh, that Bui Sun Phai painted. He was friends with Bui Sun Phai. And he met a Russian woman in 1983 and he married her in 1985 and they opened up uh, what they called Salon Natasha after he had spent some time in the Soviet Union with her and believed in this idea of kind of creating a space where people could come and talk about art and make art. This um, Sanon Natasha, um, it's, you know, uh, decades of activity from, you know, 1990 to 2000. And um, uh, so 10 years, over 10 years of activities has all been recorded and uh, documented and archived by an organization called Asia Art Archive in Hong Kong. And uh, I helped uh, to do this with Natasha after uh, Wu Zentan passed away. And it's become this kind of record then of how um, art and contemporary art in Vietnam can flourish without official institutions. And this is very important because art history has often you know, been written by official institutions and museums are institutions art organizations are institutions the ministry of culture is an institution but what about all of these individuals and people who are not part of institutions and don't they get written about in art history as well and so this is something that's that we tried to capture in archiving uh Sanon natasha so here is um, the address, the street, and this is the interior of it. And um, it continued after Wuzentan's um, death to be a space where artists could come and meet and so forth. But during its heyday, it was you know, a site of performances, of sculpture making. It was very kind of surrealist. It was a site of improvisation. It was a site of freedom and experimentation. And this is what Wuzentan wanted. Because it was a private home, the government couldn't come in and censor it, um, and anybody was welcome to join. And um, a lot of events and activities took place there. Uh, Tan himself was a well-known artist. His work is actually in um, the Singapore Art Museum, for instance. Um, this is uh, his kind of signature works where he was very uh, he used found objects. Um, he was a very, he was really a Dadaist or a surrealist in that he uh, took um, un, incongruous objects and turned them into art. So for instance, he found cigarette boxes and then converted them, gave them wings, uh, turned them into bugs or butterflies or something and kind of making comments on uh, consumerism. And so this is, as opposed to kind of the official circuits of art in, in Hanoi, where there was a state-run uh, gallery, there were these official events and openings, people cut ribbons, or generals came, the police came, and uh, government officials came. Uh, so it was a very different kind of site from that. 
And so the the move to kind of liberate art from official discourse had started already around this time that uh, Simone Pasha opened by other people as well in what is known as doimai or new uh, renovation or kind of opening up of the country to uh, the outside world. And I mentioned uh, Nguyen Quan, the art historian who had written a book um, about um, the art of the village. He also was a painter and he also was interested in surrealism and I was definitely interested in countering this so socialist realist movement, but also trying to be much more free, poetic, um, not follow conventions, not follow rules, and still somewhat remain Vietnamese. So that was always this, this kind of drive. Um, he made his own kind of celebration of the victory of Dinh Dinh Phu, but it's very abstract, very cubist. So it, it made it to an art history book, but it's very ambiguous and not very clear. Um, he, he painted these portraits of women with their heads cut off. Um, he was very uh, spontaneous and Im improvised in his painting, very experimental and uh, um, expressionistic. And uh, his, he kind of was a pioneer. He was influenced by Salvador Dali, for instance. Um, here the, uh, painting of Dali's on the left that showed these statues that are cut off or the arms cut off and stuff. He was interested in, in capturing women in that way as kind of statues or holding mirrors. Um, and uh, he was very influential to a group of young artists that rose to attention in 1993 called the Gang of Five. And they had a uh, exhibition in the official art space and yet their work was very different from uh, what their, the official uh, um, painters had. It was semi-abstract, very colorful. Um, and uh, so the five members were Deng Sun Hua is one of them, who um, painted a lot of self-portraits like um, uh, Bui Sun Fai and Yun Sang did, you know, three decades before. So, this is the period of kind of a renewal of modernism and a renewal of uh, experimental painting that hadn't had kind of disappeared since the French had left. So, but it didn't disappear entirely because it still existed in unofficial circuits. So this suddenly becomes the moment where experimental painting does get recognized by the state. But it doesn't mean it's new because Bu Zentan was um, painting uh, independently, Nguyen Quan, Bui Sun Fai, Nguyen Sang, all of these artists had already been painting modernist, expressionistic work. It's just that they weren't showing them in, in, in official spaces. So the art history textbook tend to get confused and often write that the Gang of Five were the new, pioneers, young painters who were very experimental, and yet they, they copy almost uh, uh, literally um, their predecessors of Bui Sun Fai on the same vein. A lot of still lives, much like Bui Sun Fai did with the lamps, um, vases, and here also the portrait of um, Deng Sun Hua with a poet next to him is a lot like um, Cafe Lum, the portrait of Lum and his cafe and Bruce and Fai sitting there, uh, you know, domestic scenes. <clears throat> this artist, Chen Lung, um, painted very kind of abstractions of insects and ponds. He was interested in nature and looked at, um, you know, the frogs and uh, larvae and, um, uh, you know, looked at uh, in, in, in kind of amphibians or uh, uh, worms and those kinds of creatures um, that inhabit the ponds. And yet kind of, uh, and the one on the left shows almost like a naked woman. Um, so kind of suggestive forms, maybe sexual forms that are kind of hidden inside these um, depictions of insects. He became though a pioneer installation artist and then later also became a pioneer uh, performance artist. 
Uh, he's, he was invited to, uh, to exhibit in Europe and discovered kind of performance art and also discovered performance art from the Japanese uh, artist who came to visit Vietnam in 2001 named Seiji Shimoda. And so he was uh, inspired to do a work where he stuck rice to his body and stood in this um, coal field, the coal mining region. And more recently, he's been doing these performances where he takes this pioneer red scarf and invites audience members to kind of whip him. Um, another one of the artists, Hachi Hu, um, uh, painted scenes of the countryside and rural life and in very uh, sad, uh, not very enthusiastic form and kind of morbid, uh, but then also geometric abstract ways. Um, much like Busan Fai did for his street scenes. Um, these are uh, semi-abstract um, with things house turned upside down and then um, things off scale, uh, women hidden in, or images of women hidden into the scenery. Um, he still continues these kinds of paintings today and is quite successful commercially. Um, so that's also kind of the era of commercial painting. And by commercial, I mean the paintings that sell very well in galleries and yet are maybe not necessarily contributing to new ideas about art, but are very popular. And uh, here are some of his paintings or his signature paintings and he made a lot of money with these paintings, um, uh, tourists could afford them because they're not very expensive and they seem to capture something Vietnamese or so, that's what people say. Now, what about women artists? I wrote an article in the 1990s also because I know about women artists because I noticed that they're often overlooked or they seem to be either heroes like we saw uh, depicted by male artists uh, as much of art history is kind of similar in that way where male artists depict uh, women but the women artists themselves are not often recognized. Well I met this artist in Timon Bic who had actually participated also in the resistance movement and was celebrated for her silk painting. And she had to have a job like everybody else and painting was really just a pastime for her even though she studied at the art school um, with male classmates. Um, but she traveled around the country because she worked for the electric company. And uh, so she was very intrigued by the different minority groups that she saw. And this is a, a representation of Cham people who lived in the Southern coast of Vietnam and um, was very interested in portraiture and um, painting on silk, which is a difficult medium because it's very delicate and the, you have to use watercolors that uh, get absorbed very quickly by the silk fabric. And so you have to be very precise in your lines and you have to be very careful in the application of color. And uh, so she was quite skilled at this, but this is not to be confused with some of the socialist realism that we saw because these are not idealized uh, versions of women, for instance. There's a woman here breastfeeding, but the other woman on the right is old. She has wrinkles. She has too many sweaters. Um, she doesn't look like a, a, a beautiful or heroic woman. She looks very simple and very modest. So. She, she's interested in, if you will, in ordinary people, not celebrating the heroes of the past. And she, at 90 years old, recently had an exhibition at the French Cultural Center in Hanoi. So here she is, so she can stand up making a speech as her paintings have recently been rediscovered sort of by an international community. And she lives in the countryside and, and she still paints. Another woman who drew a lot of attention in the 1990s, who also did not make realist or heroic uh, images of women, but rather did these kind of stick figures and um, uh, very simple schematic forms of women. And she called them girls. And she said, because she was tired of the way in which women are idealized and told they have to have a beautiful body or they have to beautiful hair. 
she wanted to just convey the idea that they're just ordinary human beings with their own anxieties and uh, issues and psyches and um, ugliness. So she was kind of ca trying to capture um, that uh, aspect of womanhood. Uh, another artist who's often overlooked because she works in paper and she uh, studied at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, where I teach, and was the first Vietnamese uh, artist to study. She got a scholarship and she became very interested in paper and uh, has worked uh, on this medium for, for since she left uh, the School of the Art Institute. And she's not exhibited much because her, her drawing style and her paintings are not very sensational or grandiose. They're very small sometimes. These are very tiny paintings. And so she um, attends a lot of residencies. She went to Japan to learn about Japanese paper making techniques, for instance. And it's very interesting just kind of working on uh, craft. And um, she teaches, she teaches yoga. She also teaches art to children. So she earns a living that way. And her artwork is not necessarily collected, even though it's very interesting. Another artist who's um, uh, a woman who um, uh, was born in Vietnam, but her family went to the States and then she moved back to Vietnam and al was also interested in a traditional Vietnamese medium of lacquer. And uh, lacquer is, uh, has been used as a painting material since the colonial period. But she was interested in really um, expanding the vocabulary of lacquer and expanding the way in which lacquer is used. So her first installation after she returned to Vietnam were these big boxes that she painted lacquer and she painted different scenes. So she imagined them to be sort of like coffins, but also to be like surfaces that people could eat on that represent food or funerary rituals. But lots of different kind of meanings and lacquer is very uh, intensive and labor intensive she has to hire people but she also does it herself of kind of rubbing the lacquer onto the stone i mean burma has a tradition of lacquer as well but here she uses it as really as an art medium she made one series of work where she actually put the lacquer material on a slide and then put them in a slide projector and then blew it up to show Kind of the inner, like it's a like it's a scientific experiment to see what exactly lacquer is made of, and then she made this huge installation, a large installation by lacquer um, that is you could actually walk through it with this um, dome, um, and um, uh, you can look at kind of almost like uh, reminiscent of churches in Italy that had painted frescoes on them. And she called it specula, which is a surgical tool of going inside the body. So she was seeing uh, lacquer as a kind of skin, she said. So you're actually going inside the body. Um, a group of independent artists founded a collective called Nasan, Nasan Collective. And you see Nguyen Man Hung, who I just paintings I sh showed earlier of the airplane jets carrying grocery food that he made. Um, a sculpture out of that painting. They organize um, a queer film festival. Um, uh, Nguyen Phuong Lin, one of the founders of this collective, um, uh, grew up uh, with parents who were uh, participated in contemporary art events and stuff. And she started exploring different materials like here salt and in the one on the right is, is, is made of nails. Um, uh, performance art also became uh, started becoming popular in the mid 2000s. Um, Nguyen Hui An, who uses charcoal and um, draws out the shadow of this table in charcoal and then proceeds to erase it. Uh, Li Huang Li did this performance with uh, sanitary napkins and so they're pushing uh, a lot of uh, boundaries and pushing definition of art. Li Huang Li, who's also a bit of a feminist, made this installation uh, in Thailand uh, called uh, Monument to Round, of Round Tray, where she sees the tray as a symbol of servitude 
and she created this pyramid and then proceeded to kind of bang on the trays as a kind of protest against how women are to serve. Um, Yun Huyan also performed this uh, same charcoal um, shadow uh, performance using just this material of charcoal. So this Nyasan collective grew out of an independent space um, called Nyasan, or, which means house on stilts. It likes San Natasha as a site of experimentation, mostly for performance art, away from the eyes of the government. Um, uh, they could host uh, a lot of performance events because under the um, in the main part, the ground floor of the house on stilts, the inhabitants live upstairs and then the artists could perform downstairs. There was a lot of room. It was outdoors. It could accommodate a lot of people. Here's one artist who actually ironed pigskin on, on her arms, um, which was very scary for people. And you see these onlookers. Uh, Feng Ning, I mentioned, also organized a performance festival. And uh, so it became kind of a, a strong community of artists um, that uh, nurtured um, performance art as a medium. Chung Tan, who came out uh, as gay, uh, as an artist in, in, in this performance uh, series that he did here, he took photographs of where he wrapped himself in the sheet and then liberated himself as a kind of literally coming out. He also um, pushed a lot of um, uh, boundaries of art and, and life and uh, queering and you know, cross-gender uh, performances, wearing dress. He, he became interested in fashion. He, he lived in France for a while and learned how to sew and started making his own clothes. Um, he also um, learned about graffiti art and um, created these characters that looked like penises and very um, uh, uninhibited and um, kind of pushing this uh, freedom of expression. Um, this work actually in 1994 was then subsequently bought by the Guggenheim Museum in New York and uh, you know, very pioneering in 1994 to show kind of looks like someone uh, crucified but with a rope tied around his genitals as this kind of talking about the constraints of Vietnamese society and attitudes towards homosexuals. So I saw him there at the Guggenheim uh, exhibition in 2012. And then um, Fan Tang Nguyen or Tang Nguyen Fan, who um, also was a second uh, student from Vietnam to study at the Art Institute, School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Um, born in 1987, quite young, her parents, you know, knew the war, but she was born way after. I was very interested in uh, experimental cinema and uh, uh, interested in ethnography, interested in highlands, and is one of the kind of rising stars of um, Vietnamese art today. Uh, another collective called the Propeller Group. Um, formed in Ho Chi Minh City. They met in California, uh, moved back to Vietnam, and were very interested in media and uh, commercialization and kind of satire and irony in uh, Vietnam's current kind of hyper-capitalism. And uh, Tuan An Trung Nguyen, one of the members of the group, did this series of paintings where he found also uh, street paintings, but then he overlaid um, the different layers of uh, Vietnamese history and visual culture from the propaganda poster to graffiti to uh, ads for products and so forth. And so he's kind of cat capturing this landscape or urban scape that is now the cities in Vietnam where you see uh, a public service uh, poster encouraging people to wear helmets. And then suddenly you have Ho Chi Minh there, almost as if Ho Chi Minh is encouraging them to wear helmets, but you also see next to it, like a billboard and an ad for um, a tooth toothpaste or something. 
Um, so the returning Vietnamese artists, the artists who lived um, for a time in America and then moved to Vietnam or, or grew up in America and are Vietnamese or visiting Vietnam, they're quite common, as you see. I, I talked about Dinh Cule, I talked about Yan Va, I talked about An Mille, I talked about Propeller Group as well. This uh, artist, Phung Do, um, that didn't move back to Vietnam, but she, when she visited Vietnam, she decided that she had a kind of identity crisis because she knew she was Vietnamese, but yet the scenery and the kind of Vietnamese people that she saw on her return trips were not quite like her. She wanted to capture that in photo, and so she found this way of, of taking a portrait of herself, holding the shutter speed, so this is prior to digital photography, where you had to actually click on the camera. So she's holding the, the release for the shutter and taking a self-portrait. So this is again before the selfie, 1998, picture of herself against the background of um, Hanoi and here with her relatives. So you see her being somewhat disconnected from the people around her. And yet she's looking at the camera. She's quite conscious of her photograph being taken, but the other people in the room are not really paying attention to the camera. So it's her way of kind of showing this a contrast between her and her relatives. Sorry, this is Phan Tan Mien. Um, uh, I misplaced that uh, photograph. So that's it for me. Um, I hope this uh, gave you a kind of overview of where contemporary Vietnamese art kind of situates itself within the context of recent Vietnamese history from the late colonial period through the war to the present and to understand how our artists actually can contribute to dialogue and discourses about Vietnamese politics um, and also where they situate themselves both in and out of institutions in and out of official dialogue, um, artists who who capture current events or who capture national events versus those who really just want to be left alone and capture uh, more experimental ideas. These are all part of debates about the nature of Vietnamese art when the government says this is you have to paint this in order to be patriotic and an artist also wanting to break free of those constraints and to really have their own independent voice. Thank you very much.